I guess there's always been a part of me that felt like there was something missing in my life. I always felt a little uncomfortable in my skin. And when I got this information, it felt like an invitation to figure out how to be more comfortable in my skin. Hey, great to see you. You too. Hey, how you been? You doing I'm well? I'm good. It's so good to see you. You too. This is so cool that you're doing this. You know, I'm, my whole life is based around curiosity and learning about people, places, and my favorite type of people are people like you who are interesting, but also interested in the world. And, the, and I learn a lot. And honestly, I'll steal some things from you in this conversation. <laughs> Apply them to my I'll life. give them freely. Thank you. You won't have to be a criminal. Thank you. I'll give them freely. You've been an artist for a long time. You're, how long have you been doing it, by the way? I mean, I don't know that I ever. Were you a kid as a kid? Yes, you... I was. I mean, I was a very dramatic child, my mother tells me. My grandmother actually used to call me Sarah after like a turn of the century stage actress, Sarah Bernhardt. But I guess I started auditioning when I was around 12 or 13. That's when I started really trying to do professional work. Your husband's a professional athlete. Yeah. Athletes are always, I talk to them a lot, obviously. Yes. They set out to be really good. Well, well first off, they, like an artist, just are, enjoy it, right? You yeah, like, they have like a, a love kid, for you just it. just love mm -hmm. to play. Mm -hmm. other than they, they find that sense of flow. They, they escape that. themselves. There's something bigger than themselves. Yeah, and you lose that. yourself in yes. it. Yes, yes. And then somewhere along the way, Usually about high school, it's like, oh, if I'm really good, I can go to college for free. Mm -hmm. Shit starts happening mm -hmm. for me. I can mm -hmm. get free sneakers, whatever. Yep. <laughs> more girls, like, more boys, yeah, yeah exactly. all more of that. More boys, uh -huh. more girls, everything. Uh -huh. Cooler. But then it's like, but if I'm really good, they'll pay me millions of dollars. Right. But I don't necessarily have to be famous, but a lot of them get famous kind of not, not ever going for it, just being really good. That's so interesting. And as an actor, it, you know, the more box office you are, the more money right. you make. You right. actually, if one of your goals is to make more money, mm -hmm. then you need to be more famous, mm -hmm. right? If you're, if they put your... They're um, much more tied together. They're much more tied together, together, yes. But I never, my goal was not to be the girl on the poster. My goal was to be, um, it was a safer goal. It was to be the working actor who gets cast all the time, like the, the longshoreman of acting. Got it. Like somebody who, like a great character actor who you see again and again in films and who directors know they can count on, but who wasn't famous as me. Because part of what I loved about acting was that I got to disappear into characters. But it's funny when you were talking about it, I had a really similar journey. Like in high school, I really loved it and I, had friends, and then when I started thinking about college, I went to George Washington University in DC, and they had a theater scholarship. And I always say it was like being on the basketball team and rarely getting <laughs> benched. Like, how I kept my scholarship was I had to at least minor in acting, and I had to audition for every single play. Wow. So it was like you had to go to practice. You had to, there wasn't like, I don't want to play that game. I don't like that team. Like, you just were always on the court. You were always working on your craft or your skills. And I was able to be on the starting lineup most of my four years of college. And at one point, does it, or did you realize there's the artistry of it? Yeah. But then there's the business of it and start to deal with that balance. Yeah. I think it was halfway through college. I was, it was the summer between my sophomore and junior year. And I was doing this summer conservatory program in New York. So it was like acting all day long. Like I would get there at eight in the morning and we were there till eight at night. And it just was like, I was so happy because I was just doing what I love all day long. But we had a course as part of that summer called Acting as a Business. I've heard a lot of artists complain that they don't, when you go to film, I have a friend, mm -hmm. uh, Ryan Kugler, who I've had this conversation yeah. with, he's like, yeah. They don't actually teach us the business. They teach us how right. to make a film and they do but a great how job. how to sell it, yeah. Yes. So I had this incredible teacher. Her name is Karen West. She's still in the game. And she started, she really invited us to think of ourselves in two ways. To think of ourselves as CEOs, right? To think of ourselves as we are a business, we're running a business. We have to think like business people, think about strategy, think about brand. I mean, this was so long ago, but she really encouraged that, which felt like it was in opposition to everything we were learning in scene study and this more creative work, but I knew it was important. She also 
taught us to think of ourselves as products and not to objectify ourselves, but to think of like, what is it about you that's sellable? What, you know, what is your type? What are you like? What are your goals? And to not be afraid to think about those things. So I, I think that was a really important turning point for me because I, oh, you know what? I also learned about, and I talk about this in my book, I learned about actors' unions that summer. Oh, really? So you didn't even know that? I didn't really know. And I was a member of SAG because I had done some professional work in high school, but I didn't really know what it meant to be in a union. I didn't understand the importance of it. And that summer I got like, oh, this is a guild. This is, this is a professional organization. This is a community of people. And what it said to me was, I don't have to want to be famous to make a living as an actor. That I could just like have a really fulfilling life of doing this work again and again and make enough money to pay my dues in the union and have health care and be happy. So I think I, up until that point, I had never thought that I would pursue professional acting because I never thought I would be famous. I didn't think I was— Did you want to be famous? I didn't. I just wanted to, like, tell stories. I think I was intimidated by the idea of fame. I don't know. Maybe it's not 100% honest to say I didn't want to be famous. I didn't even let myself want to be famous. I just didn't feel like it was in the cards for me. It wasn't. I wasn't the kind of girl that was on the cover of magazines. And for some reason, that was the, the limited beliefs that I was walking around with. You, a lot of times, use the characters that you've played yeah. to live like their truth to be, and kind yeah. of shun your own. Was that like natural or were you doing that on purpose or was that a way to be great in the role? So when I was growing up, um, like my mother is this incredible woman and she's very stoic and elegant and she's not a very emotionally expressive person, right? <laughs> she's, she, we do have a very close relationship now and it's one of the things I talk about in the book is kind of how we got there. Like yeah. we're very, we have, we share a lot of emotion it was a now. Long, a bit of a, a very path, right? Big journey. Windy journey. Yes. But growing up, it was like, I, she, she wasn't a feelings person. And then she had this kid, me, who was just like a walking feeling. Like I was constantly having big feelings. You're only child? I am. And because my mother's an educator, I got really lucky. She didn't tell me like, shut up, don't have those feelings, stop crying, be quiet, play small. Like she instead, put me in these children's theater companies. She put me in plays and in gymnastics and in ballet. Like she gave me all this stuff to do to be expressive. And so I started learning really early on that on stage was a place where you could have big feelings and nobody got intimidated. In fact, you got rewarded. It's part of the job. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So I think I just started going to these characters as places where I could express emotional truth and not threaten anybody, like not have anybody feel unsafe by my big feelings. And you also talk in the book about perfectionism and people yeah. pleasing. Yeah. And do you think that came from because your mom was so stoic? Was that part of it? Because I've had dealt with that too. Not necessarily perfectionism, but like I went to this, um, I had this couple come over my house that do this, take you on this breathing trip. Breathing work, breath work? Breath work. Yeah. I've never gotten high, I don't do drugs. I drink wine and, and tequila, but I, but I assume that's the feeling, like you get high just from breathing. Yeah. And through it, I realized like I'm very hard on myself. Mm. And I can't say I don't like it, like, but, it I, but I was able to recognize you. it. It served me, yes. Yeah. But now hearing about your mom, my question is, does it maybe come from her because she was so stoic? She, you don't know, that type of person, sometimes you don't know if you're pleasing them or doing yeah. the right thing for them. I think that was part of it. I think part of it was trying to like, close the emotional gap between me and my parents. But it also got fueled in the same way that yours got fueled. You know, in business, it can serve you, right? So as an actor, if you know all your lines, if, you, if you're always reaching for better, it, there are rewards. Like we live in a world where it gets rewarded. It's just like the, there's a darker side to it of never feeling um, good enough. Right? There's like the wanting to be perfect. Under Underneath that is the feeling imperfect. So that's, I feel like, the work that I've had to do in awareness of, you know, allowing that ambition, allowing that desire to want to be great without, um, without beating myself up or feeling like if I'm not the best, I'm therefore not worthy, not lovable, not, you know, a waste of everybody's time and air. Did you used to feel that way? Yeah, I think I 
still can feel that way at times. I do the work to not feel that way because I know it's like a voice that I've learned how to turn the volume down. But if I'm not attending to it, the volume creeps up. Got it. It yeah. gets loud. Yeah. And does it get loud, like, literally in the work, like when you're on set? Or does it get loud, like, when you're by yourself in the quiet? I mean, it's a beast. It can get loud anywhere. Got it. Anywhere. But again, like, when I'm on set, I try to let it be a positive. Because, like, any superhero, right, it's your, it is your greatest flaw and your greatest power. So when I'm doing a scene and I'm like, we don't have it yet. We don't have it yet. We don't have it yet. Like, that... That desire to like, no, there's more truth here. There's, we can do better. This can be more moving. This can be more honest. That's great. Like that is, that's been a huge asset to me. And I walk away proud if I feel like we did the real dig to find to get the there. truth. Yeah. Um, but also there are times where we've probably gotten there and I'm still digging. And everybody else is like, we're good. We're good. We're we're good. It's time to go home. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. When you're doing that, is it enjoyable for you or is it more like, do you record? Because for me, it's actually enjoyable. The dig. Yeah, it's like yeah. to keep pushing and mm-hmm. like figuring it out and figuring out. That's the most enjoyment I get. So let me ask you, when do you know that you're done? When do you know that it's time to move on? Well, at our company, we have a line that, especially in artistry, especially with creative people in art, the work is never done. You just run out of time. At some point, you got to let it go. Yeah. I always am like, that could be better. That should have been better. Okay, when was the last time that you did something that you were like, I stuck the landing? I did it. I don't know. Really? Like, in business, life, or Either, general? anywhere. Where you're like, well done. Where you could say, like, well done, math. I can walk away. Um, I have small things throughout the day, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It could be something like... I was just with my five-year-old son for a week and watching him, and I'm like, oh, I help. I see him developing in ways. I'm like, mm. I helped him develop. That's I stuck the landing on that. Mm-hmm. But I'm also like, but I still got a lot more. That's behind me. Right, right. He's There's only more five. I got do. more to yeah. do. And work is hard for me to find those things mm. because I'm always I will pick apart my things till there is nothing but a carcass left. And do you do you <laughs> feel like that's part of your success? Yes. Yeah. Because I like she feed off and get literally a high off of figuring it out in the process, mm. like going through it, going through it, going through yeah. it. That's where I feel the most comfortable. It's where my, it's where the joy is for me. Like I, premieres are fun, covers of magazines, especially because I never thought that I would have that kind of re- career. Like it's, that's such a blessing and it's exciting. But for me, the joy is not the movie poster. Like the joy is one o'clock in the morning when I'm at my kitchen table and I'm looking at the script and I'm like, I don't know what that, why do I say that word? I got to figure out why I'm saying that word in that moment. The thing that brings me the most joy is actually when the camera's on the other actor and I feel like I have given so much to that actor that I watch them do something in the scene that they didn't even know they were capable of. Like I bring something out of them that they, I know they're going to go home proud of the emotional truth that they were able to reach. That's my greatest joy. Wow. And where do you think that feeling comes from? Which one? Like the... The the love of sitting there at 1 a.m. digging on something, like just like trying to find it, find it, find it, find it. Did somebody teach you that? So I talk in the book a little bit about how like... In my household, I felt like there were truths that I wasn't privy to. And so I feel like I have this nose for truth, where I'm always looking for like an emotional truth. And so that for me, when it's 1 a.m. and I'm trying to figure out why that word, it's because I'm looking for the emotional truth. Or when I'm across from the other actor, yeah. it's like, I want that, I want them to say that thing that they didn't <laughs> know, that, you know, like that's, I'm looking for that, that raw humanity. And I feel like in some ways it's because I was looking for it as a kid. Um, and I was sensitive to when it was there and when it wasn't there, even though I didn't exactly know what the circumstances were in my household. So that's what I bring with me to my work, is that like I'm looking for that kind of alive, that like vulnerable aliveness in the work. You've talked about your in your house, your dad, who is your dad, you found out much later he was not your biological dad. Right, right. Later in life. Yeah. And when you found that out, it brought you closer to them. You know? Yeah, yeah, it did. I felt like... Um, 
You know, I think a lot of times we feel like um, the truth is going to endanger our relationships. Like it's going to push people away. And I guess that does happen at times, but more often than not in my experience, when you walk through truth together, it brings you closer together. When my parents told me, it was like they took my glasses and cleaned them and handed them back to me. Like suddenly things in my life made sense in a new way. Like relationship dynamics with my mother, with my father, with my cousin. Like suddenly I was like, oh, oh. And so I I partly wrote it to make sense of it, to like write my understanding. You talked about having big emotions as a kid. Do you still have big emotions? Because I imagine that was a big emotional. And did you... Get upset, happy, where you will, I'm sure lots of emotions were bubbling up. Yeah. I think I, I do still have big emotions, but I am, like, one of the messages that I got in childhood was that it's not okay to have big emotions in real life. It's really only safe in the work, right? And so I've had to learn in my intimate relationships, like in my marriage, how to have big emotions and, like, that people won't run away. Um, which has been such a gift as an adult and with lots of therapy to be like, oh no, I can have my feelings and it's okay as Carrie. I don't have to have them as a character. When they told me my first big feeling, honestly, was like excitement. It was so weird. It was very unexpected. I was like curious and excited. Like, oh, this is, I guess there's always been a part of me that felt like there was something missing in my life. And I, like I talk, you know, I say this thing in the book about how Oprah had asked me to be on Super Soul Sunday. And I was like, no, 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 no. There was this sense that like, I didn't know enough about myself to talk about myself in that way. I just, I never, I always felt a little, I always felt a little uncomfortable in my skin. And when I got this information, it felt like an invitation to figure out how to be more comfortable in my skin. You've done lots in your career, um, but as we've talked, you're an overachiever. Who always, so what, yeah. what else do you want to do? I love producing. I think producing is so fun because for me, I really, it's that feeling that I have with a scene partner when I help them win in a scene, but you get to do it with the whole crew. Mm-hmm. Like where you get to create an opportunity for everybody to chase excellence together. When you go into like, because it is art when you're producing specifically, because mm-hmm. I produce a lot of things, but there's a lot of it that's not art. Yeah that the, like as a producer, there are decisions you have to make that don't necessarily jive with how an artist would look at mm-hmm. this because there's, it could be a- Your a, fiscal a, a responsibilities. Fiscal timing. Schedule, you know, location. Time, schedule. Mm-hmm. How do you turn the artist off? Because I like to, I'm a producer, yeah. but I'm not an artist. Yeah. So I never have to worry about turning that. I'm like, how does this become great? But right. also how do we hit the budget? How do we hit right. the time? How do we, so I like that tension. I like the tension because I actually think sometimes when I, even as an artist, like, you know, you might have your mind set on this particular location, right? And then you get there and it's not available on the day that your number one can shoot because they are in first position on something else, right? There are all these other factors. factors And I love that. I love that problem solving. And I love that I, I, there's this magic alchemy to it where I feel like in the end, I know that the location that's available when my number one is available is going to be the right location. Got it. So those are those kind of like happy accidents that I feel like I'm willing to live in the tension between the artistry and the business. I think creativity always needs tension. It I does. I think 100%. It, I think you always need two things kind of going back and forth and and and, and really because that's where the best yeah. things— You refine it. You, you refine sharpen. It. But to, to that point also, I also, you know, I think about you and LeBron and I think like, I also have a really amazing producing partner, right? And Pilar is, um, she's extraordinary. But there are times in a project where I'll turn to her and say like, I'm, I'm taking off my producer hat now. Like for the next week, yeah. I have to like go in, I gotta go deep. And so like, don't call me about budget. Yes, <laughs> like, don't mention you, it. You me. have to do you that. You deal with that. I'll shit. circle back around to you. And then like, it won't be a week. Two days later, I'll be like, are we good on budget? She'll be like, yes. we're fine, go back to your script. Like, yes. But it, having a great partner is also important, somebody that I can trust. Because I can't, I cannot hand over the creative work to somebody else. That's me. Yeah, of There's course. only one person who can do that part. Yes. And so I have to have partners to be able to expand. The theme of our company at Spring Hill is make it till you make it. And it's obviously a play on the fake it till you make it because yeah. our feeling is 
like making it is literally about you have to make something and keep going yeah. and it's there is no end really there kind of is no finish line I kind of no. that's actually a Nike line there is no finish line I feel that way about just like keep making things until you've to you to you really make it right and then make it again and, and again going. and again and yeah. again and again yeah do you feel that way about everything you do or is it just acting or is it every like at home cooking mom I think what I love about the make it till you make it is, and I do think this is like across verticals, if I feel stuck or if I feel like I'm facing a failure or if that like that volume we talked about, if it's turned way up telling me I'm no good, I'm not a good mom, I'm not a good actor, I'm not I'm a failure as a producer, why am I writing? Like whatever those voices are, I often find that the way through that is to make something. Got it. Is to like take action. And not like not to take action to run away from the feeling, but to say like I'm having this feeling, it's super uncomfortable. I want to take a contrary action to remind myself, to invite myself into remembering who I really am, which is not a failure. I'm not a failure, yes. right? Like even if I have a moment of not getting something right as a mother, I'm still listening, I'm still learning, I'm still growing, I'm still committed to doing better. So what can I make? What can I do to get back on the horse? Get back on track. Yeah, like, you know, a movie comes out, it doesn't do well, it has terrible ratings, awful reviews. Like, you know what? Read another script. That's how we do it. Like, that's, you just got to get back. Going. You have to keep going. Yeah. You can't let it take you out. You just have to keep creating. It's humbling, that thing, because I think I, sometimes I want to think I can control it. I think that's where the perfectionism sometimes comes from, is like, if I'm perfect, I'm going to avoid the pain. But like, the pain is inevitable, especially as an artist. Um, that's part of the process. So just keep doing it. I agree. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank Kate. you so much. You've been much. amazing. This Thank you. This is so guys. great. What a great conversation. Thank you. You're so good at this. No, you make it easy. <laughs> <laughs>